this is the way it's going to be. This is what is going to happen. Not that Jacob Prash said so. The New Testament says so. We're told ahead of time, this is the way it's going to be. This is what to expect. This is what's going to happen. Second Peter, chapter 3, please. For years, you heard me saying, and I wasn't the only one, but I was saying it. Others may have said it in different words. We are better off being a part of something that is growing slowly than we are being a part of something that is dying quickly. I've been saying that for more than 15 years. We are better being a part of something that is growing slowly than we are something that is dying quickly. And again, I don't go around with prophecies all the time and predictions. And I'm very leery of people who do. And I certainly don't claim to be a prophet, and if somebody does claim to be a prophet, it almost inevitably is an indication that they're a false one. <laughs> but if you remember in 2008, I was one of the people, and I was certainly not the only one. But the Lord gave me that message in America and Britain, everything that can be shaken from Hebrews before the market crash in 2008. And I told people, everything means everything, including the church, and we're going to see the collapse of megachurches. We're going to see the financial collapse of megachurches and ministries that are not ordained of the Lord or that may have been ordained of the Lord but deviated from his ways. And the first megachurch, of course, was the Crystal Cathedral in California. Closed up 58 million U.S. dollars over 30, 32, 33 million pounds in debt. People bought, yeah, crystal block windows dedicated to themselves and their family, and they, they, they bought all the marble slabs. You know. The Catholic Church bought the place at a bargain basement sale and have renamed it. Now, you understand to the Roman Catholic Church that represents Roman Catholic domination over Protestantism. That's how they think. It's there with David's offices. That's how they would think about it. We've conquered the biggest, the first mega church in the United States. We've conquered it. That's how they look at it. Now, Schuler was, again, he's somebody who began as at least ostensibly evangelical. He'd been a friend of Billy Graham in the 50s. But he ended having the Grand Mufti of Damascus in his pulpit on television preaching that he wouldn't mind if his grandchildren became Muslim. And as you may have heard me point out, that when the Pope, not this one, but the previous pedophile protector, came to Los Angeles, he said, we have to ask the Holy Father the way home. You don't have to ask him anything. Just hand the keys over. Now it's his home. <laughs> he got what he deserved. He brought it on himself. Lakeland is gone. Church without walls is gone. They're beginning to go. Everything that can be shaken. I'm not saying they will all go. The ones who remain loyal to the word of God, the ones who will repent, sincerely repent, and there won't be many of those. I also said in 2008 that while many churches and ministries are going to go into financial collapse, and financial decline and numerical decline, there's going to be other ministries that God is going to preserve and even bless and prosper. Um, I have a very good source that TBN, because of the growth of internet television, their, the key to their power had been their satellite. And their revenues are down 40% of what they were on a year. 40% because people can now go on internet and onto Roku and these other things. They no longer have that monopoly. Now, Moriel is, of course, beginning Moriel TV on Roku. And already in Japan and in the States, the new TV sets are being built with the Roku boxes in them. Here you have to buy the Roku box. It's, the, the Lord is opening a door. Now, Satan has had control of Christian TV for too long, but now there's, there's alternatives to it. 
things are being shaken. The growing remnant, the declining majority. There's a thing called his channel in the States, just Christian Internet TV. TBN tried to buy it out. Other ones tried to... It's all changing now. We're in a state of transition, of flux. Things are going to be different as we looked at last night. It's going to be a new situation. But what is going to happen? What can we expect? This is the way it's going to be. This is what's going to happen. Look with me again once more, please, to 2 Peter chapter 3. In the original Greek text, we have a literary peculiarity. The first four verses are one quadruply compounded sentence. <laughs> if you were to put it into English, there would be semicolons instead of periods. The translators break it down into four verses. In Greek, it's one extended sentence. It is absolutely massive. Now, it's that way because it's to be understood as a single thought. In English, it would be a mini paragraph, but in the Greek text, it is not. Tautain ele agapatoi dutran umin grapho epistolon. To you now, beloved, this is the second I write epistle. Therefore, he's making some reference in this one to things about which he wrote in 1 Peter, dealing with the same issues found in chapter 3 of 2 Peter. Again, bearing in mind there are no chapter divisions in the original Greek text. Two things specifically. One is the reference to Noah and the flood in 1 Peter, which is also in 2 Peter. And the other is in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. It puts it into an eschatological framework. This section of Peter must be understood as eschatological. And this is what he says. Enais de Gero, I like literally roused or shake you up. Umo en upomenese, a reminder, I shake you up with a reminder. Ten elecrone dianoien, a reminder of with the sincere mind or of having the sincere mind. Une thene, in order to recollect, ton, and it's, it's really strange now, prore menon, things that I spoke of in this other epistles, but it says, uh, grammaton, the specific words. In other words, the specific words used in this passage. If they're found in the previous epistle, it shows us what he's talking about. I'm using the same words in this one that I used in the first one. He's talking about the same stuff. The end of all things is at hand, and also something about the destruction of the flood, of the deluge, of the Noah narrative. Then he goes on, and he says, Upoton... Egion of the holy propheton of the holy prophets, kaiteston apostolon, uh, umenon, and toles to kurion kai uh, sotaros. As was predicted, prophetically predicted by the holy prophets, and as the Lord commanded through the apostles. The Old Testament prophets predicted this stuff. This is, relates to what we looked at last night. What happens to Israel 
happens to the church, 1 Corinthians 10 type stuff. But with Jesus, it's different. This is not what the Savior predicted. It's the action he commanded in response to what is predicted. This brings us back to the Olivet Discourse, where he's warning about the false teachers, the false prophets, and the deceptions perpetrated against the elect. The way Israel was deceived, there's going to be a move to deceive the church. Same words. The apostles reported what Jesus commanded. What Jesus commanded was what to do in response to what the prophets predicted. This is what's going to come. But then Jesus tells us, specifically, what to do about it. Now again, in Greek, it's all one big compound sentence. Tauto proton. This firstly. The word proton is interesting. Because in this particular chapter, you have what can only be interpreted. To what degree understood may be a matter of debate, but can only be translated as the language of atomic physics. The Greeks did not know about subatomic particles. They only knew about atoms. And their knowledge of atoms was far from complete, obviously. But you have the word proton here. Positively charged particle we know in modern physics. They didn't know that. They thought the atom was the basic unit of matter. They called it stoichiae, where you get the word stoichiometry, like the periodic chart in elemental chemistry. It's an incredible chapter, as we'll see, but it begins using the language of nuclear chemistry, atomic physics. But it makes some incredible statements. The concept of subatomic physics did not exist until the early years of the 20th century. It wasn't until people like Niels Bohr and later, of course, Einstein, that people really began to understand subatomic physics, Bohr theory, quantum theory. They didn't understand that at all. But this chapter makes some rather incredible statements when you translate it literally. And it's interesting, the word proton occurs in the text. Knowing this firstly, gonoskontes, from the word genosko, to know in an intimate sense. It's not something we are to be intellectually aware of. We are to know it in an intimate sense by Holy Spirit revelation. It's not something that we're just intellectually aware of. It's a nasos. Conos contes, OT, Eliosante, there shall come ep eschaton ton emeron, in the last days, eschaton, eschatology, in the last days, what's going to come? Know this first of all. The first thing that's going to happen in the last days. And pig mone, and pig tai, kata tes idias, epithumias, auton, poros menoi. People are going to come who are mockers, and they're going to be motivated by lust. It may include sexual lust. It doesn't specify that. Although Peter does talk about sexual perversion elsewhere in 2 Peter, so it probably includes that. 2 Peter and Jude are similar, and it talks about the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. So it obviously involves sexual lust and sexual lust of an unnatural nature. But also there could be lust and will be lust for power, lust for position, 
lust for things for the sake of self-edification instead of edification of the body. Lust for things for self-glorification instead of the glorification of Christ. Lust is always a quest for self-glorification. It doesn't matter if it's to do with finance, lust for money, like greed. It doesn't matter if it's lust for power, lust for sex, or something. It has to do something with the attempt of man to deify himself, to glorify himself. Instead of glorifying the Lord and having him glorify us. Now here's the problem. He is not only talking about pagans. He is talking about people who profess to be Christians. This is the overall context of the epistle going back to chapter 2. These guys are going to come in the church. What are they going to be mocking? In the last days, these mockers, driven by lust, are going to come and mock according to their own lusts. Katates idias epithumias. Oton poremenoi kai legontes pau estin e epigeglia tes parasuis. We get the word parousia. Auto. They are going to mock people who say it's the last days. Those who understand the word of God and see what's happening prophetically. This is what the prophets said was going to happen. This is what Jesus commanded us to do about it. Those who see that and say that are going to be mocked by the others. They are going to mock you. They are going to mock me. They will mock us. We will be the objects, targets of open mockery. Now understand the context. The pagans didn't know about the Hebrew prophets. Go to our book table in the back. We have this book, The Day of the Lord is Coming by David Hawking. Countdown to Calamity by Tony Pierce. Wars and Rumors of Wars, Iran and Israel by Mark Hitchcock. The End of Money, again by Mark Hitchcock. Shadows of the Beast, Jacob Prash. The Bishop's New Clothes, Nice Jewish Boy, Steve Maltz. When they see you reading books like this, they are going to mock you, it says. A time is come when they're going to mock you for reading it. Now the word there used is interesting. It does not use the word rima or logos or evangelion. It does not use the conventional words for scripture. It uses the word graphos. They're going to mock the writings. Well, let's look at the reality. Go on his website. You know what he says. Avoid end time prophecy. It's a diversion. Rick Warren. You go on YouTube. Click on Mark Driscoll. He mocks Christians who study prophecy. He stereotypes them all as conspiracy theorists obsessed with the Illuminati. He mocks them. In this country, if you believe in the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews, what is supposed to be mainstream evangelicism will mock you. People like Sizer openly mock Christians. They mock. Gerald Coates called the rapture a fantasy and a myth in this country. 
Rick Joyner called it of the devil in America. Mike Bickle said the rapture of Elijah was God's judgment on Elijah. <laughs> they openly mock, you understand? Now we're told ahead of time they're going to mock you. And God calls them mockers. But what defines them as mockers is not just they mock, it's what's motivating their mockery. We are told that these people are driven by some kind of lusts. I'm telling you, there's a reason. There's a reason that Mark Driscoll uses such vulgar language from the pulpit. I have absolutely no hang-ups about addressing sexual or marital issues and things like this theologically, none at all. But the language in which he does it, to try to seem hip and relevant to young people using vulgarity in church, there's no need for it. There's something wrong with that guy. They mock. This is exactly what we were told is going to happen. They're going to mock you. When you read books like this one, or like this one, or like this one, or like this one, they're going to mock you. And that's why they're going to do it. But Jesus commanded us. Jesus didn't just predict it. He commanded us what to do about it through the apostles, it says. Let us continue. Now it says in verse 3 again, Tauto proton. First of all, you must understand this. Contes, you must understand it by Holy Spirit revelation. You must know it intimately. What are they going to go around saying? Kaila contes to estin e epeglia tes parousias. Where is the promise of his appearing? Where is the promise of his coming? Where is your parousia? We shouldn't think about that. Rick Warren says it's a diversion. Jesus said, be alert, watch out for these things. No, it's a diversion. Young people flock to Mark Driscoll. Where studying prophecy is mocked. Quite a thing. It's exactly what we were told is going to happen. We shouldn't be surprised by it. Go back a generation. Some of the books were good, some of the books were bad. But at least everybody was reading prophecy. The late great planet Earth and all this. At least everybody was interested in it. Now today, the people who read, now I'm not into fictionalizing eschatology. I like Tim LaHaye personally, he's a good man, but I'm not myself into fictionalizing eschatology, the Left Behind series is not my thing. But my sister's brother was saved by reading it two months before he was killed in the World Trade Center on September 11th. <laughs> Jonathan Kahn's a nice guy. I agree with his thesis that the West did not learn the lessons of the Islamic attacks. I agree with his theme. I don't care for the book itself, The Harbinger. I'm not into fictionalizing eschatology. But people who do that are mocked by the other ones. You understand? They mock, they ridicule, they belittle. Then it goes on. Parousias, where is the promise of his presence? Then they say, Auf, auf es ger oi pateris ekoi matheson. 
from the time which our fathers fell asleep. Now the fact that it uses fell asleep, Methesin, that is a popular Christian metaphor going back to Jesus for the death of a believer. Unsaved people die, believers go to sleep. It shows he's warning it's going to be believers or people who say they're believers saying this. People claiming to be Christians are going to be saying this. Since our fathers went to sleep, oh, Christians have been talking about the return of Jesus for years and for centuries and he's never come and where is it? They're going to mock Then it goes on. Ever since they met they sin, gone to sleep, Panta Otos, Diamene, Ape Arches, Kitiseos. All things remain or stay as they've always been since the beginning of creation. Now it brings the issue of creation into the text. He begins introducing something from the creation. Interesting, he does that. Bearing in mind, he refers back to his first epistle when he does the same thing concerning Noah. That's where the first sentence ends. Four verses, one big sentence. Understand this. In the last days, there's going to be people in the church who are going to be mockers. And the reason they're going to be mockers is because they're motivated by some kind of lust of their own that's going to cause them to mock you who study and understand prophecy is being fulfilled. They're going to make fun of your belief that his presence is coming. And they're going to say, Christians have always said this and he never showed up before. Why do you believe it now? Now again, we all know about the boy who cried wolf syndrome. We know the damage done by people like Harold Camping and so forth. Someone who the devil also raised up. But now the close, he leaves it with the creation. And then he resumes talking about the creation. Lanthene ger autos. It's hidden from them, or like disguised from them. Tauto, thelontes, oti, orenoi, Uranus, like heavens, esen ek pele, kai ge, ek udetos. That they're a deliberate ignoring of the unmistakable reality, or something that's axiomatic, we might say, that by the decree of God, the heavens existed long ago and were made out of water. Again, they had no idea that the most common element, the most common stoichiae, was hydrogen. Number one, atomic number of one on the periodic chart of the elements. This chapter makes a lot of statements concerning nuclear chemistry and atomic physics that people could not have known at that time that you don't find in other ancient literature. Other ancient literature had all kinds of myths and things. This gives scientific basis of what God made the universe out of before science could confirm it.
And then it says, Sunesetosa, having been held together. This is a present continuous active in the sense it, it's, it's aorist with a present continuous active. It means it happened, but it's still an ongoing action. How is it being held together? Kauto theon logo. Now instead of grapho, it says logo. It's held together by the word of God. Who is the word of God? Jesus. He holds it together. They're always talking about, is there a fifth force? People in particle physics. We have strong force, weak force, gravity and electromagnetism. Is there a fifth force? How can we account for the matter in the universe? That's, how can we account for it? There must be a fifth force. I know what the fifth force is. <laughs> is there a fifth force in addition to strong force, weak force, gravity, electromagnetism? With all due respect to Enrico Fermi, who was a brilliant, brilliant physicist, discovered strong force. There's a fifth force that makes the others work. The world was made through him. He's the Logos. The Onhotote, cosmos, through which the world, <coughs> Udete, by water, doesn't use hydros, it uses Udete, literally water, water, not just hydrogen. Cataclysis. It's where we get the word cataclysm. The world was inundated or drowned. Apolito, we get the word Apollon. It drowned or it was perished, it was obliterated by water. But now something happens in verse 7. Oti de nun, orenoi, kai e ge to oto logo. But now, heavens or skies and earth, ge, by the same logo. Tefe seres menoi, having been kept to the side for a future purpose. Estin puri, are for fire. Taromenoi, es amaren kriseos kai apoleis ton Esobon, Anthropon. It's showing two biospheres. The antediluvian biosphere before the flood was destroyed by water. The present biosphere is going to be destroyed by fire. Darwinism is based, we have the creation conference here with Dr. Rossevere and John Mackay and Andy McIntosh and so on and Rick Oliver. Creation is based on presuppositions. It depends on presuppositional argumentation. You have to take on board the presuppositions for the rest of it to add up. But if you don't take on board the presuppositions or if you question the presuppositions, the whole system collapses. Well, we have a Darwinistic worldview. They don't see this change in the biosphere that took place with the flood. Entropy, as we talked about, I talked about at the conference, entropy, the rate at which things lose particles and decline, entropy took place at a slower pace 
before the flood than it does now. Now, it took some generations for that to affect the genotype, but that's how those people lived to be hundreds of years old. Carbon-14 dating, all of these things, depend on the presupposition that entropy and bioentropy always took place at the same rate it does now. No, there was a fundamental geophysical and geobiological change in the biosphere with the flood, it says in Peter. You can only argue evolution if you take on their presupposition. Entropy did not always happen at the same rate. Now, Peter tells us there's going to be a third change. A third fundamental change will take place in the biosphere as fundamental as antediluvian and postdiluvian. A third one is going to take place. But as the first one was wiped out with water, the second one must first be wiped out with fire. Now it says, by the same word, by Jesus in effect, by the decree of God in Christ, that the earth and the heavens are put in storage or kept to one side for a future purpose that is going to come to destruction. And this will be a judgment, a crisis. Crisis kai apolaiston esobo anthropon. A judgment on unholy or impious men. Esebon anthropon. Then he goes on. Ende toto un latineto umas agapetoi. But don't let this be hidden from you, the ones who are beloved. Otimia amera paracurio us kilia, kilogram obviously, ete kai kilia ete os amere mia. We translate it a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. This may or may not be understood as the Lord will come between the second and third millennium. He raises on the third day. A day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. He's coming somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 A.D. or C.E. or whatever. There are those who have made that argument. I'm not saying they're right. I'm not saying they're wrong. But I'm saying it is a very interesting verse. That obviously has a hyperbolic meaning for the way God looks upon time. But the question is, does it have a more specific meaning for us in terms of prophecy? I'm not prepared to be dogmatic about it. I simply point out that there is a question to be answered. But let's then continue. He goes on after this to say, Au bredonai kurios tes epigelius. Not slow is the Lord about or of his promises. But then it says, os tines bradutete as some slowness agontai deem. It's not slow as some count slowness. God is usually slow by human reckoning, but he's never late. He's usually slow, but he's never late. Fortunately for us, he's slow to anger. But when his judgment comes, it doesn't tarry. 
Neither does his salvation. For the sake of the Gentiles, we're told in Romans, he's slow to save Israel. But when the time comes, he's going to save Israel. <laughs> he's usually slow. He's almost always slow in prophetic matters. The things that happened to Israel and the Jews were foretold two to sometimes 400 years ahead of time. When it happened, it happened quick. We have to understand when it says Jesus is coming quickly. It doesn't necessarily mean in five minutes from now, but it means when it happens, it's going to be quick. Like when the train comes into the station. It doesn't mean it's going to be here in five minutes or ten minutes. It might be an hour, but when it comes into the platform, it's going to pull in quick. As some count slowness. He's usually slow. But he's never late. Then it gives us the reason which we've already hinted at. Ele, macro dumia es umes, because he is long suffering towards you. Macro dumia, same word Paul uses in Timothy with great patience and instruction. Umes. Ue bolomenos tines apoleste ele pantes es metonion curese. The reason he is slow as some count slowness is he's wanting none to perish but to all to reach repentance. I happen to have been in Scotland the day, you may have heard me tell this story, I apologize if you do, it's real, the day when that guy Hamilton murdered those kids in Scotland, in Dunblane. I was on my way back to England from Northern Ireland and I was in Scotland the day it happened. The following Sunday I was speaking at a church in Warrington in the north of England and some guy brought his unsaved friend to hear me speak. He had been witnessing to his unsaved mate, and he brought him to church. And the guy came, and the guy, the unsaved guy, came up to me after the service. And he said, if your Jesus is such a powerful God of love, how could your Jesus have let that happen to those children in Lockerbie? Lockerbie was like what Dunblane was in America. How could he have let that happen? Uh, if I was a God of love and I had that kind of power, I wouldn't let that happen to those kids. How can you expect me to believe in your Jesus, that that's your God? My response to him was based on this. It wasn't my response. It was what the Word of God said. First of all, you're blaming the wrong God. Jesus made it clear that because of your sin and mine, Satan is the God of this world. <laughs> You're blaming the wrong God. Now the New Testament says, Jesus came that the works of Satan will be destroyed. My God is going to get rid of your God, but in the meantime, don't blame my God for what your God did. <laughs> my God says your God was a murderer from the beginning. Now let me tell you why he doesn't do it today. It's because he loves you. And if he destroyed evil, he'd have to destroy you with it. He's giving you a chance to repent and believe the gospel before it's too late because he doesn't want to destroy you with it. That was the answer. And we've all had questions like that, haven't we? How can your God let this happen? That's the answer. Second Peter 3. Usually slow, never late. But then he speaks about the day of the Lord. Again, we have David Hawking's book, The Day of the Lord Draws Near. It's on the table in the back. Verse 10. Hexe de amera. But will come the day, hurion, the day of the Lord. Os kleptes. Klepto, as in kleptomaniac, like a thief. 
Now, we deal with this on the teaching, the great church robbery, Harpezo. Kleptes. Enei orenoi, the heavens, rokedon, paralusante, with a rushing sound or like a thunderous sound will pass away. And then it says, Stoikie de Kelsomene, Lute se te, Kaige, Kaite, Enote, Erge, Ore Fe se te. The elements or the atoms, the fundamental building blocks of matter, we translate it will be dissolved with fire. The elements will be dissolved with fire. It's not destroyed with intense heat. It's it'll be destroyed explosively. And the earth and the works that are upon it will pass away or will be discovered. We say pass away, but in Greek it will be discovered. This coming judgment is going to cause the works done on the earth to be discovered. I will tell you exactly what it says in the Greek language. That which is indivisible, the stoikie, will be divisible. To the point that the entire biosphere, the entire post-Diluvian world will be destroyed by it. Now when you go back and say the water, we're not talking about plutonium or enriched uranium. We're talking about hydrogen. <laughs> In both cases, the biosphere will be destroyed with what it is primarily made of. Three quarters of the planet's covered with water. The first time, the water destroyed it. The second time, the atomic structure of the water will experience a subatomic fission. The elements will be dissolved with fire. I assure you, you ask anybody doing A-level physics, before Albert Einstein, nobody, nobody hypothesized that that was even possible. Not only does this fisherman say it's possible, but it says the whole world can be destroyed that way. Again, I wouldn't be dogmatic about it, but the destruction of the eyes melting in the sockets in Zechariah, that's what happened to people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I look at Mark Hitchcock's book, Iran and Israel. Now you have countries like North Korea with nuclear weapons. They have sold every weapon they have ever made. Now you have an Islamic country, Pakistan with nuclear weapons with agreements to sell them to the Saudis. The Saudis want to get them because they're afraid of Iran, not Israel. They know Israel's a democracy and would only use those weapons in response. But a Muslim would push the button and say, Allahu Akbar. So now you have a nuclear armed Middle East on the horizon while the American and British governments <laughs> kneel down in Geneva and lick the camel dung from the sandals of the mullahs. <laughs> I just hope the American president and the American secretary of state do what they do best kneel down and lick. That's what they did in Iran. That's what they did in Egypt, isn't it? The Muslim Brotherhood. Well, Christians are being exterminated. In Syria, Benghazi, take your pick. It's exactly lining up. The nightmare of a nuclear-armed Iran? Now we're talking about Daniel chapter 10. This is no longer a hypothetical scenario.
This is the reality. If these countries get these weapons, they will use them. It's not hard to see how it's going to happen. The stage is being set. But of course, when you point this out, when you tell people, look, you need to read what Mark Hitchcock is saying about Iran. Or listen to my tape, Iran and Prophecy, or Jeff Seif's book. They'll ignore you. Look, this thing's happening. These countries at the center of world events in the Bible. Look at there at the center of events again. These people are getting nuclear, going nuclear. Don't you realize what these people are? They're crazy. They're jihadists. They love death the way we love life. They believe the only way to have salvation is to be shahadi, to die in a jihad. Don't you understand what's happening? They'll just mock you. At best, they'll ignore you. Well, I'll mock you. Quite a thing. It was not only predicted that they would do it, but Jesus commanded us, through the apostles, it says, how we should respond to them. This is quite a thing. In verse 11, he goes on to say, these things thus all being dissolved, lumenon, potopos, dee, uh, aporkein. How does it behoove us to be as men, or what sort of men should we be? Umas and egies and holy, anastrethes, conduct, kai. Eusebius and holiness or piety. The first thing it tells us to do when we see these things being put into place, when you see them mocking you because you're showing them prophecy, and when you see the prospect of thermonuclear devastation, the first thing we need to do is to clean up our own act spiritually and morally and ethically. What kind of people should we be living like? But then it says something else. Prostocantas que scodontes ten parosion, testo theo. Amaras de en orenoi, poromenoi, luce sante, kaistoikie, kalomene, tegete. Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Because the skies or the heavens are going to be set ablaze, or ignited, ignited, and dissolved when the atoms, the elements, are going to melt. That's literally what it says. But look at it again. Spodontes ten parousian. Hastening the parousia. We can make Jesus come back faster. In eternity, it's fixed. God is outside of time, obviously. While he may know it now, when he was here, he was not personally cognizant of when he'd be coming back. Even Jesus didn't know when he was here. I've explained this before or tried to. When the crop permits, it says in Luke, the Lord of the harvester sends the harvest. 
In the Song of Solomon, when the bridegroom comes for the bride, do not awaken my beloved until she pleases. We are not waiting for Jesus to come back. He's waiting for us to hasten his coming back. By being the kind of people we should be, living moral lives, of course, that's first. But by seeing people get saved and discipled, we can hasten his coming. Because he told us, remember he told us, and Peter refers to what he commanded us. If he doesn't come back, no flesh would be saved. The only thing going to stop us from wiping ourselves out is the return of Christ, his presence, his parousias. If he doesn't come back, we will obliterate human civilization permanently. We can actually make him come back faster. When the crop permits, the Lord of the harvest sends the harvesters. Do not awaken my beloved until she pleases. Yes, in eternity, God already knows, obviously. But even Jesus, when he was here, did not know. Relative to us in time, in Kairos, it is a variable. Yes, it depends on God. But when Jesus comes back, also depends on us. Not if he comes back. That's God. But when he comes back, depends in part on us. Daniel speaks of the rescue. Well, that's quite a thing. But then it speaks of the third biosphere in verse 13. Kenos de orenos, but new heavens or new skies, kaigen and earth, kene katato epegelma. There will be a new one according to the promise, oto prosdokoman, that we await and always the Kaisian in righteousness katakoi dwell. That for the ones who dwell in righteousness, there will be a new heaven and a new earth that's awaiting us. There will be a partial redemption of the present biosphere in the millennium. We read about this in the book of Ezekiel. There will be a partial restoration to the earth and of man to its Adamic state before Adam sinned. But that will only be a mere precursor to a new heaven and a new earth. Satan has access to the present heaven. We are told in Job, Daniel, Zechariah, and Revelation. He will not have access, of course, to the new one. That is one of the reasons there must be a new one. Satan will not have access to it. So as Noah was rescued, again, he refers back to Noah in the first Peter. It was destroyed by fire, uh, water. As Noah was rescued and put into the post-Diluvian biosphere, we are going to be rescued and put into the post-nuclear biosphere. That's exactly what it says. The way Noah was rescued before the first destruction of the first biosphere, those who dwell in righteousness are going to be rescued from the nuclear destruction of the second biosphere to be put into the next one. Hence, just as it was in the days of Noah, as Jesus said. Everybody understand? One, two, I don't like to aggravate you with my Bible college Greek. 
I only resort to Greek or Hebrew, well, I read it myself, but I only resort to making you suffer through it when there's something in the text that needs to be explained better than the translations handle it. So I go to Nehemiah 8.8, give the literal sense of the original meaning, like in Nehemiah 8.8. I only do it when there's a reason. I don't like to put people through this kind of grueling ordeal unless there's a reason to do it. If it's a Nehemiah 8.8 thing, I'll do it, but otherwise, I won't bore you with it. So now we can go back to the English text. The rest is pretty straightforward. Verse 14 to the end of the chapter, the last five verses. Therefore, beloved... Since you look to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace. Now, the word there in Greek is erin. It is not shalom. It is the Greek idea of, of no conflict, spotless and blameless. We should not be in conflict with each other or, obviously, with the Lord. Our focus should be on being spotless and blameless. And regard the macrothumia, the patience of our Lord, to be salvation. Just as also beloved, our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. How gracious and humble Peter is. Now this is an important passage in understanding something that a lot of Christians would rather skim over sometimes. We deal with it on the teaching what the Bible, real, the real gospel of health and wealth. And also in his letters speaking to them of these things in which there are some things hard to understand which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures. The word there is also grapho, to their own destruction. And therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ is always him coming to earth. Christ Jesus is him in eternity. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Peter was an apostle. Paul was an apostle. God used Paul more than he used Peter, despite the fact that Paul was the least of the apostles by his own confession. He was not one of the twelve around from the time of John's baptism, and he persecuted the church before becoming a believer. He was the least of the apostles by his own reckoning. But God used him the most. Peter wrote two epistles that are very important. And it's amazing that God uses a fisherman from Galilee to talk about something that involves nuclear physics. <laughs> However, Peter has no problem saying, look, Paul is more educated than I am. There are things that are complicated. Let Paul explain them. I know Koine Greek, and I know Aramaic. Paul, he knows the original Hebrew really well. You know, Paul, he knows Latin. He's a Roman. You know, he, he was a rabbi. He can explain it. The New Testament speaks similarly of Apollos. There are two things to be aware of. Both are pseudo-spiritual. Both are based on pride and ignorance. This is the first one. Oh, he's an educated man. He knows Greek. He knows Hebrew. He went to Oxbridge. He went to an Ivy League university. He went to a famous seminary. He went to a prestigious Bible. Oh, he must be enlightened. <laughs> Paul says you can only really understand these things by the revelation of the Spirit.
be careful of those who take people who are formally educated and put them on a pedestal and try to make it. On the other hand, be careful of the pseudo-spiritual morons. These are the pseudo-spiritual morons. That's all head knowledge. You don't need that education. Boy, you just need Jesus. I got the Spirit of God, and I've been preaching four to seven years. Hallelujah. <laughs> Both of those attitudes are driven by pride. The person who speaks that way is an ignoramus who's insecure about a person who knows more than he does. Neither one of those positions are scriptural. Paul had no problem saying, let the rabbi explain the complicated things. And the history of the church has always been like that. Again, I'd point you to the recording that we did, the real gospel of health and wealth. But now it deals with the command. There's going to be people who are going to take things that are difficult to understand, like eschatology, like end-time prophecy, and because of their own instability, they're going to twist it to their own destruction. And it's not only talking about Jehovah's Witnesses. As they do with the other scriptures. Knowing beforehand, know that these guys are going to come. Beware of them, lest you get carried away in their error of the lawless men. Now the word there is not a nomon. It is a different word for lawless altogether. It is not people who are completely without the law of God. It means people almost like with criminal behavior. The word is ephismon, ethesmon. It's not a normal, but they will behave in almost a criminal fashion. Know ahead of time that these people will come along, and if you pay attention to them, you're going to lose your own stability. You're going to lose your own compass for where you're going. You're going to throw away your own map where you're heading, which is the Word of God. You're going to get like them. You're going to distort the grapho, twist it. Remember the people doing this, the reason they mock is because they're mockers. The real reason they're mockers is they're driven by some kind of ungodly lust. Don't listen to such people. They're going to come, but when they show up, Get away from them. In the name of God, get away from Rick Warren. In the name of God, get away from Mark Driscoll. In the name of God, get away. It's direct. It tells us exactly. The growing remnant, the shrinking majority. Peter wrote, that is the way it's going to be. That is exactly what the word of God tells us is going to happen. Well, the fact of the matter is, it's not what's going to happen. It's what is happening already. God bless.